Good afternoon, parents and families, uh, and welcome to orientation uh, in the College of Science and Engineering. We are, my name, my name is Paul Strykowski, uh, professor of mechanical engineering, and some of your, your students will have me for fun things like fluid mechanics and thermodynamics and jet engines, and I also every year take a group of, of students from in any major to Tanzania, where we do water system design. The reason I'm with you today is because I am the Associate Dean. As Associate Dean, my job is to make sure your students have an outstanding experience, great student services, uh, and we prepare them for the world that will follow after they graduate from the institution. Before I begin, I want to introduce my great colleagues uh, who are joining me today to give you some background on who we are and what we are and how we operate. Uh, I will begin with uh, Mark. Trivum, uh, our assistant dean, followed by Amy Gunter, followed by Chrissy Francis. So, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Trivum. I use he him pronouns. I am the assistant dean and director of Collegiate Life. Nice to see you all. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Gunter. I use she her pronouns, and I am the director of academic advising for the college. Hi, everybody. My name is Chrissy Francis. I use she her pronouns, and I am a career counselor in the CSC Career Center. You will be hearing from all of us, starting with me. And uh, we, we give a, a good chunk of what you will hear is what we've shared with your students as a part of orientation to give them a sense for how life at the university is both exhilarating and challenging. Of course, things that they uh, both, both need uh, to prepare them for their futures. Uh, we also, your students certainly are in what would be the senior summer and their heads are in maybe not quite the university space quite yet, but. Uh, and uh, but we want we want them to this is a beginning, I would say, of orientation, meaning that we'll give you some ideas of how things will, will uh, transpire and certainly hope that you stay engaged with us. Your students will stay engaged with us as we walk through an orientation process, which is pretty intense, even through the whole entire first semester. And in some ways, uh, we th we are there to guide uh, students all the way through their four years at the institution. So let me begin a little bit to talk about us as an institution and our students. So you know your, your students well. Um, the incoming class is um, one of our largest, but actually as far as the University of Minnesota goes, it's a relatively small group. It's 1,400 or so incoming students. Uh, they are from all over. Um, interestingly, which I don't have in the graphic here, is that there were over 10,000 students who applied to the College of Science and Engineering, and your students were the, the very <laughs> talented select subgroup uh, that is arriving. And we are actually thrilled, I should probably state that, just to be able to come back and see humans face to face, uh, see uh, all of us experience the lovely green space, which we call home at the university and the Twin Cities campus. And um, it will be it will be really, really fun for all of us to smell, both smell the fresh air and see each other. Uh, they are very accomplished. I think you all know that many of them. Uh, did not take ACT and SATs, those that did, we, our average is typically around 31, uh, and they're very, very accomplished academically. I can trust, trust me when I say that they are all ready to go. Uh, we have really an all-time record number of women in the college. I think I, I started here about 34 years ago, when we had about 10% women. Uh, this year, not only do we have a record number, uh, record percent literally at 31%, but we have almost 500 uh, women joining the freshman class this year in the college, and that's absolutely outstanding, as well as about 27, 28% students of color. We think this is incredibly valuable uh, with our my experience, personal experience in engineering and the physical sciences. Some of the greatest design, some of the greatest work is accomplished by being creative. And creativity uh, often doesn't happen when a person is sitting in a box by themselves. It, it, it happens by synergistic relationship with others. And the more diverse the thinking experiences are of those around the table, the more creative and outstanding the design can be. And, and really our students will tell us, and I think you would appreciate that, that it is uh, in fact, um, they think our students think of themselves as techies, but actually if you ask them what they want to accomplish, they wanna re really, really improve the human experience. It could be more efficient engines, it could be more efficient use of energy generally, medical device design. The point is that there are a lot of things that we can improve on as a society uh, technically, and that's what their goal uh, it generally is. The uh, University of Minnesota is a land grant institution as most uh, major public institutions are in this country. Uh, and as such, we are a majority from the state of Minnesota, about two thirds in fact. 
uh, seven, but, but just because of the population distribution, about 50% from the seven county metro area around St. Paul and Minneapolis, 13% all over the state. Another 11% from Wisconsin and the reciprocity state, Illinois, and about 9% all over the US. Uh, and this year we'll have about 10%, which is about typical for us international. Uh, so very, very wonderfully blended class. Uh, and uh, we're excited for them to come this year. Possibilities. Well, you know, certainly on paper, the possibilities are really quite fast. Uh, the college has, it's not a college of engineering, which many of our uh, uh, comparable universities are. We are a college of science and engineering. So we include about, we have exactly 12 engineering majors. I won't list them here. You can see some of them. We also have six uh, degrees in the physical sciences and mathematics. And we have a degree in computer science and data science rounding out the 20 degree programs. When I talk to your students, I shared with them, they will have really, really cool titles on their business cards when they graduate. Actually, we did survey them, pre-survey when they came to orientation. About 90% of your students expect to graduate in four years and about another eight or so percent expect to graduate in less than four years, which is really outstanding. And the reason for that is that many come in with a very large number of, of credits, college level credits. But you know, when I say the possibilities in CSC, the title of the degree is actually not even begin to explain the possibilities. The possibilities for these students are really limitless. So it, it, it sort of honeycomb tells you that our students really don't think necessarily right now about things outside of their initial degree programs and degrees of study. They certainly are thinking about multiple, maybe they'll do dual majors, they'll do a minor, the point is that students in science and engineering, if they have a rich respect for their liberal arts education, I'm talking about history, social science, uh, leadership, understanding diversity, understanding the power of knowing your weaknesses and your strengths, they can go anywhere. We have more students every year per capita that get into medical school who never even think that medical school is an option as a freshman. Many of your students will do minors in business or leadership, will take courses from the Carlson School of Management. Uh, it really, and, and, and I think you may know, many of you, that uh, there are more CEO women and men uh, in Fortune 500 companies that have degrees in science, technology, engineering, math, and any other degree programs. So uh, it's really quite limitless. Uh, we do have students that go into, into patent law. Uh, I put politics. Yes. I mean, science and engineering would be a really, really very valuable there. And, and I put one blank honeycomb uh, just because really uh, they can do anything. So we tell them that it's going to be hard work for them. We also tell them that once they figure out what they're going to do, and, and right now they're 17 or 18, maybe they don't know, but once they figure that out, all of a sudden hard work is not so hard. It's really a passion and it drives them. And that will come very, very soon in their studies. We are student services. So as a professor, I can tell you there's 420 professors in the college. Um, we are a supporting operation that provides the services to the students to help navigate a complex but incredibly uh, opportunity-based uh, or opportunity-laden institution. We are made up of three components, uh, academic advising, our Career Center for Science and Engineering and Collegiate Life. Uh, these things overlap really very, very much. I know, at least for me, when I was in college some <laughs> several decades ago, uh, I didn't even think about careers. I didn't think about a job. In fact, I didn't go to our career center until I was a senior. Now we actually talk very openly about that careers are really, really important. And it's, it, it's essential that they think about what they're going to do with this education. Because if, for instance, a student comes to us or one member of my team in any one of these areas and says, I really would like to work on environmental solutions to some climate issues or to energy or to whatever, the atmosphere, you know, what degree do you, we don't have a degree in energy. We don't have a degree in, in, in like solve the environmental problem. All our degrees uh, interface. So it's a really important to talk to our professional team, not only about courses to take, which is of course very important. Do they want to study abroad? Do they want to do internships and co-ops? How do they want to blend together the in-classroom experience with the out-of-classroom experience? And that's really uh, what our team does for your students. We also know that, you know, you can imagine listening to me and my leadership team here that for half hour or so, 
you, you, you'll take in some, forget most. Um, and we know your students are the same way, particularly because they're in the middle of their senior summer and they have other things on their minds at this point. At this point. So we actually require each one of your students, that's right, every one of them have to take a one credit course called CSC 1001, first year experience course. There are 1,450 of them. Hence, we divide them into about 40 different sections. They find one hour a week that works in their schedule and they see us. They see us in relatively small groups, about 35 students. We talk about everything. Essentially, a bit about what I'm talking about today, but they'll be better listeners, let's say, six weeks in or two weeks in or eight weeks in because it'll all of a sudden make sense. Why are we talking about time management? Why are we talking about uh, teamwork or career exploration? Uh, that all sounds abstract. It all sounds sort of like, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, and so we meet them every week and we meet them and talk to them about what's relevant in their life when we meet them. And so they will talk about this and they tell us actually that a lot of it, well, this is common sense. And then three years from now, they tell us, wow, I'm so glad they told, told me that because I didn't realize that. Of course, as parents and family members, you know how many times you tell your students uh, this, that, and the other thing. And they go, yeah, 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 whatever. And then three years from now, they'll say how brilliant you were. That's just how it works. In any event, uh, the students really do say the most important part of this experience is that they get to meet another 35 students from the college who will be friends for life and also probably and hopefully a good study partner. So we have pretty rigorous academics. I think you know that when you have 10,000 students applying uh, and only 1,400 of them are showing up, that means it's tough, it's academically rigorous, and that is absolutely true with your students. Uh, in fact, we are the most difficult college at the University of Minnesota to get into. So what does that mean? Well, we have what we call the Big Ten Plus academic expectation. Uh, it's not well documented because it's sort of behind the scenes, but the Big Ten Plus is the Big Ten, which is not 10, it's actually 14. Complicated math there. So there are 14 schools in the Big Ten and they are all outstanding publics and privates. Together with the following seven schools, Stanford, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, Cornell, MIT, Georgia Tech, in Texas. Together, these 21 schools would like to believe we're the best schools in the world in science and engineering, and we'd like to keep it that way. To do that, we compare notes every year. I meet with the associate deans of the Big Ten Plus every year. We go to a different campus, get to know each other again, talk about what the expectations are. I share these expectations with your students, and I'm going to share them with you now so we all have a very clear understanding of what is ahead uh, for your students. So, we asked your students uh, and their orientation surveys, whether they've or gone through orientation or not is immaterial. We've asked them how many hours they spent outside of class in high school, studying or doing homework, essentially outside of class doing academics. We also asked them how many hours they expected to spend at the University of Minnesota outside of class studying or doing homework. This is what their survey results tell us. You can see that two thirds of your students, 66% roughly speaking, um, are expecting to spend less than 20 hours per week studying. Now, I suspect that's maybe 50 to 100% more time than they spent in high school. Now, what I want to, what I told them, and I'm going to tell you, is that is not going to cut it at a school in the Big Ten Plus. The Big Ten Plus, Minnesota. Wisconsin, Penn State, Stanford, Michigan, MIT, you get the point. This is an elite crowd. We have high expectations. And about 9% of your students told us that they plan to study 30, 40 hours per week. But guess what? That we expect of all of our students. Now, it's probably true. In fact, largely speaking, none of your students will study 30, 40 hours per week until midterm exams because they will learn that they are smart enough, but they're not studying the way we expect them. It's not so much studying now, it's learning how to learn. So we've shared this with them. We got a lot of stare, scared faces like, are you kidding me? How can you make us do this? How are you gonna torture me, Dr. Spraykowski? Well, we said to them, well, let's, talk, let's walk through this. How is it possible we can expect this much of you? Well, it turns out in a given week, there are 168 hours. Roughly speaking, there is about one third of it is academics. So for a typical class load, 
just took an example, an average of 15 hours per week in class. And if your students study 35 hours per week, that's 50 hours a week. 50 hours a week is what many adults in this country would call their day job, right? And so, yes, so it does take a lot of time, but it turns out that you also have a little bit more than 30% of your time, a third of your time to do other things. Obviously eating, relaxing, going to a recreational center, going for a run or a walk by the river. Uh, some students will work outside the classroom because it, it's both good experience and it pays. Um, but and we also try to encourage them to keep that under 10 hours. And you have one third of your life to sleep and your students need that. That's very important for physical and mental health. So there's plenty of time, uh, but they do need to manage their time. So for that, I did share with them what a typical schedule, of course, with 1400 students, no schedule is exactly the same. This is a schedule of a typical actual freshman who was taking chemistry one, physics one, uh, calculus one, and a music course. And by the way, I may share with you that we have more students per capita in the College of Science and Engineering in the Minnesota Marching Band than any other college. These students are creative, they're diverse, they love science and technology, but they love other things as well. And we really think that's uh, important and we'll continue to push them to work outside that. But what I'm showing you is what I think you expect. High school typically is a very continuous schedule from early in the morning to early afternoon. The university life is very different. You can see this individual student is going from eight in the morning to eight, 8 p.m. on a Monday, but not very much in class on Tuesday. And the point we tell your students is it's really important to find what works best for you. When should you relax? When should you eat? When should you get up? When you should study, right? Study is important. We encourage them to find study partners and get together once a week, say on a Tuesday in the morning for this student and work on physics homework or whatever it happens to be. In the end, they have to learn the material themselves, but they strengthen their learning both by working with other students and by teaching other students. So as I said, the Big Ten Plus is a very, very rigorous operation. You might not know that students entering MIT or Michigan or Minnesota have virtually the same academic profile. On a four-point scale, the average GPA of our incoming freshmen is about a 3.9. However, one semester in, students at these 21 schools will see a major reduction in their GPA. This doesn't mean all of a sudden they're not a good student. It means that we have really, really challenging and rigorous curriculum because guess what? When they leave the institution, they've got to conquer the world's toughest challenges, whether they go into industry or they go to graduate school or they go to medical school or they go to law school, they are tough, challenging and tough. Uh, issues to, to tackle and our faculty are going to push them hard and they need it and they want it even though they may not know it. I want you to know however that perfect straight A grades is not the goal. The goal is to learn, to work hard, push yourself hard, work with others, enjoy it and again um, you will succeed if you hang in there and work hard. So uh, this is, I, I share this also with your students. These are the midterm grades last fall's freshman class in CSE, in Calculus 1, Chemistry 1, and Physics 1. We grade on basically a 100-point scale. And they all looked at me on those calls like I was crazy, once again. And maybe I am crazy, but that's part of the game, in that we just grade very differently than high school. Um, the physics class, let's take that as an example. The midterm, mid, the midterm exam percentage in physics was 55% for last year's freshman class. But if, they, if a student got a 65, your student got a 65%, they probably got an A minus. What physics is telling our students, all the departments are telling your students, is like, we don't, I've been teaching for 34 years. I can't count on one hand the number of students who have aced my exams. 100% is just not normal. It's just not what we do. Uh, the problems are gonna solve in this world are not clean, cut. They don't have one simple answer normally. So we're gonna push them. This is where they're gonna, eyes are gonna open. They're gonna, ooh. Maybe I need to study differently. Maybe my success in high school is not my success in college because I have to think differently. And this is where they're gonna start spending a lot more time outside the classroom, organizing their notes, working with friends, doing homework, but basically focusing more on academics. So in some sense, to summarize, uh, your, your students did exceptionally well in high school, mostly A's. Some have never seen anything less than an A, that's great. 
But in relative to the university, they put in moderate effort. I'm just going to be honest with you. We're going to expect them to put in exceptional effort, and they are going to love it. Yeah, they're going to complain a little bit, but it's what they need. They are ready for it. And, and they're going to sometimes get a grade like a B, which is an outstanding grade, a very solid grade. And they're going to think, uh, but I want you to know that. They need to know it because that is just a reality. One thing I didn't mention, which I should close with here, is that there is a senior or junior of, in the college who is in that freshman required class every week. And that student will say, guess what? I didn't get an A in physics or I didn't get an A in chemistry. And guess what? I'm crushing it. It's just how it is. On that, I will turn over the mic uh, after I'll just simply say, you know, inside and outside the classroom is, is really what we're all about. Academics is really, really important. Sorry, Mark. I, Mark is trying to navigate his, the, the associate dean who jumps around a little bit. So bottom line is, uh, we're, we, the students, we expect your students to both be solid inside the classroom and outside. To begin with, we just want them to focus on academics, but eventually they're going to do other things as well, and that's very important. At this point, I'm going to go back to the team, and I'm going to have the team sort of walk through each of their areas, uh, how they specialize, how they help your students, and to give you a sense for, you know, maybe who you want to contact if at some point you run into questions. Uh, it's really important for you to know how we operate. So thank you. And I hand off the baton here to Amy Gunter, our Director of Academic Advising. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are happy to have you joining us. We know it's a busy time in your lives and your students' lives as they are wrapping up high school and starting to begin their transition to college. And so our team has been working with your students um, since Really early June, we've had students coming to first year orientation so far. And part of our role is working with the students just to help them navigate that transition. So talking about majors and interests, looking at curriculum. A lot of students come to us with advanced placement or international baccalaureate. Um, some have access to college credit, whether that's through a program that's located in their high school or they're actually enrolling at a local community or local college. And so a lot of what we're doing is spending that time during orientation talking about the majors that they're considering, looking at the curriculum and the plan, and then how that anticipated credit may fit into that. And so as many of you know, at this point in the summer, uh, we do not yet have many of those scores or exam scores back yet. So students may have their high school transcript or their college transcripts and grades, but at this point we still have not received AP scores. And so that's a little bit later than normal. Um, that's been kind of the case this past year, obviously with a lot of changes due to COVID. And so um, what we do at orientation is really work with students to talk about the experience they had in the course. Um, we also have required placement exams that students need to take that are another point of information for us, as well as just kind of their thoughts about how that AP exam may have gone. And so for some students, they are deciding to move forward and take the AP credit and move into the next course. And we'll continue to monitor for those AP exam scores to make sure that they have the credit needed to do so. If not, we'll be reaching out to students or sometimes students actually reach out to us first. And so we can make any registration changes or suggestions needed based on those scores. Um, we also seem to be seeing more students this year that are a little bit more hesitant to move forward in, in some of that um, key content area. So calculus, physics, chemistry, computer science. And a lot of that just has to do with the various educational experiences students had this past year. We know a lot of our students were learning remotely. Some of them were learning in a hybrid method. Some had some access to in-person learning. And a lot of students had a whole crazy combination of all of the above. And so for some of our students, especially in courses like calculus, it may have been harder to really feel as confident in some of that material. And so for some students, that's also a great option is to um, potentially you know, either repeat the course or maybe not move as far ahead in a sequence, just to really ensure that solid foundation in some of our fundamental coursework. And so again, we'll continue to work with students throughout the summer as they learn more about some of those courses. Um, and then our team works with students throughout their undergraduate years with a lot of our focus really on the key transitions. So the first one obviously being the transition to the university, helping students explore majors, 
learn about policies and procedures, get connected to other campus resources, helping to them to find and build community in hopes that that all contributes to their academic success and well-being. And then really the next main point of transition is transitioning into a major, which typically takes place in the sophomore year. So we have all of our students really coming in with an exploring mindset. For some that might be exploring the particular major that they're pretty certain of. For some, it may be that they just know that math and science has been something that they're good at and they're not really sure what that means. And for some, it means that they're exploring majors in our college and maybe considering a minor outside of the college. And so those are conversations that we've already started having with students and will continue to have as they have different experiences, whether they're inside the classroom or outside of the classroom. So we can ensure students are keeping their options open to hopefully achieve all of those goals and interest areas while they're a student. Um, we also know that for some students, some of those interest areas don't necessarily have to be just academic. So a student may be interested in music and they may complete a music minor, or perhaps they participate in different musical groups and ensembles, marching band, things like that. Um, and so we really try and determine what's the best fit for each individual student and their long-term plans and interests. Um, and a lot of that has to do with all of the great opportunities that come outside of the classroom. And so I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Mark Shervum, to talk a little bit more about some of those opportunities. Great. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Mark Shervum. Um, many of your students are coming to the University of Minnesota in the College of Science and Engineering, having been leaders uh, in their high school or in their community or many of them were really engaged in a variety of different things, whether it be athletics or musical um, activities, uh, service, service groups. Um, in CSC and at the University of Minnesota, we want to encourage that continued engagement, um, not only within um, the College of Science and Engineering, but also the University of Minnesota. The University of Minnesota boasts that, they have, that we have about um, over a thousand student organizations. So if your student's interested in some very unique uh, thing, um, likely we have an organization for that thing. Um, additionally, the College of Science and Engineering has about 80 student organizations specifically for STEM related, related activities. And this can range from the rocket team to the solar car team to uh, Science Society of Women Engineers. There's a variety of different things, um, organizations that students can get involved in. Not only does that help their out, outside the classroom experience, but that also helps them build community, makes, um, make, has them make friendships and connections that really last a lifetime. So we do encourage students to get involved to their level of, um, of you know, comfort, but we wanna make sure that students do have that opportunity to get engaged outside of the classroom. Um, in Collegiate Life, we also wanna make sure that we create an inclusive um, and welcoming environment uh, for all students that are coming into CSE. So we have a variety of different diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and mentorship programs. In addition, we have WISE, which is the Women in Science and Engineering program. Um, so regardless of your student's identity, they can come into any of those programs, find connections, find community, find students that are like them, um, and make really lasting um, friendships. But also, we work with a lot of different corporations that serve as mentors, professional mentors for our students. So not only do they get peer connections, but they also get mentorship connections. Um, and lastly, we want to encourage students uh, to explore the globe. Um, COVID put a damper on that, um, obviously, the last uh, year and a half. However, we are uh, making plans for um, future study abroad trips, um, whether that be a semester long, whether that be um, you know, three weeks. Uh, there are a variety of different ways that your student can get involved in um, study abroad opportunities. And we do encourage students, if they're thinking about that and if they're interested in doing that, to start planning now, because as the curriculum builds, we want to make sure that they have the capacity to do the experience that they want um, in the future. So again, we want to encourage your student to uh, come to CSC, to come to the University of Minnesota, get the best education possible, but also make really great connections and find really lasting um, experiences that take them beyond the University of Minnesota. With that, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Chrissy. All right, thank you, Mark. Again, my name is Chrissy Francis. I'm a career counselor in CSE, and I'm going to talk a little bit about our office and how we work with our students. 
So I do think it's a common myth that the Career Center is only for upper level students when they're job searching, but that really is not true. We want first year students to engage with us because we can help them in a number of different ways. Um, we like talking to them about their major decision, ways that they might want to engage with different opportunities, such as the ones that Mark was just mentioning. We have a lot of different opportunities. Um, and then also helping them get their resume in good shape. So we do offer appointments for students, 30 minutes in length. And then we also have drop-in times every day where students can just stop by or join our Zoom link if we're doing them virtually. That way they can get assistance when they need it. I want to highlight a few of the main topics that we can help students with. So the first one is major and career exploration. We do know that choosing a major can be a very big decision. Sometimes students come in thinking they know what they want to study. Sometimes they take their first few classes and then might change their mind. But we can really have conversations with your students to help them learn more about their interests, their skills, their values, and what types of majors might align with those. So that can help aid in their decision. We offer career assessments, guides, um, and a lot of web and print resources as well. You can even take a peek at our website today to see some of our offerings. And then once students have selected a major, we can help them explore potential careers. We have a lot of data on our graduates, um, where they've gone on to, what companies they're working at, job titles. So we're happy to share all of that information with your students as well. There's a lot of things you can do with a degree from CSE. Um, and it can feel a little bit overwhelming sometimes if students are just trying to figure that out on their own. So we like working through that process with them to help them find a career that feels like a good fit for them. Resumes are another really big topic for our office. Um, some of your students already have a resume and that's great. Most probably do not and that is just fine too. We actually have an assignment as part of our CSE 1001 course that will help your students create a resume. They can also work individually with career counselors to continue tailoring those documents for whatever need they might have. Oftentimes, first year students will use those resumes for on campus employment, maybe even starting to look at research, or sometimes the engagement opportunities might request a copy of a resume as well. So it is important to get started on that. A resume we know is always a work in progress, so we are happy to continue working with students throughout all of their time in CSE and continue updating it until they are graduated and out of here. Another big topic is job and internship searching. Internships are very important for students' career development. Almost 70% of CSE students complete at least one internship. Some students do a couple. Um, typically that happens after their sophomore year um, and probably more frequently after their junior year um, during the summer months. They're a really great way to get some good related experience and also help students continue assessing what types of jobs or industries might be a good fit for them. Um, and that can help aid in their future career exploration as well. We help with all aspects of that job and internship search process. Um, and we also have a lot of different ways of connecting students to employers, which I'll mention in just a moment here. Interview preparation is another area we can assist students with. We do offer practice interviews with career counselors. Sometimes students find that to be a lot easier to go through some of the questions with somebody that is neutral. Um, we can give them feedback on what they're doing really well with, areas to work on, thinking about good interview strategies. And then we also have employers that will volunteer their time to conduct mock interviews with students twice a year. That's another really nice opportunity. It feels a little more realistic. Um, oftentimes I meet with students who do a mock interview with me first, and then they'll go on and do a mock interview with an employer. So they're really prepared. We do have a lot of employers that have shifted their interviewing practices to virtual environments. That's probably going to stick around for a while. So we will make sure that your students are prepared for virtual interviews as well as in-person interviews too. And then graduate school, this probably seems really far off. But when and if the time comes, we can certainly help students prepare for graduate school, think about programs that could be a good fit, and then also help with the application materials. And then I do want to mention our employer events. We have a lot of different ways that students can connect with employers throughout the year. We offer two large scale career fairs, one in the fall and one in the spring semester. In the fall, we typically see around 250 employers. And in the spring semester, it's usually closer to 150. So that's a lot of opportunities for students to make connections with employers just through those career fairs. 
We have a lot of companies that come to those from Minnesota, but also we have companies from all over the US. Um, commonly, we have tech companies that come from usually over by the West Coast, like Amazon and Google. Uh, we might have gas and oil companies like ExxonMobil and Schlumberger out of Texas. And then financial consulting, all sorts of different industries from across the US that will come to these career fairs. These are a really great way for students to continue learning about careers that might be a good fit. Um, and then eventually apply for those jobs and internships. We also host information sessions and employer site visits. Um, these are another great way for students to connect with companies, network with alumni and other professionals to just keep learning and growing and making those connections. And then we also have a system called Handshake. This is our main job and internship database. It's similar to systems like Indeed dot com, um, but just for U of M students. We have a lot of companies and employers that want to hire and recruit our students. So we'll tell them to post all of their positions within the system. That way, all of our students can access them as well. Um, last year, we had about 60,000 positions in that system, and about half of those were science and engineering related positions. So quite a good number for our students. They can also use Handshake to register for career fairs, um, research different companies, and network with other students too. All right, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about career outcomes. Each year we administer a survey to all graduating seniors asking them about their plans for after graduation. So for the class of 2020, 91% of our graduates were employed in their field or enrolled in a graduate program within six months of graduation. So that is a really great number. Um, I will mention that typically that number is up even higher, closer to 95%. I think due to COVID, that number dropped a little bit, but even with the pandemic, we're seeing that CSE students and alums are in high demand. So I don't think we have anything to be concerned about there, but that is a really fantastic number that we're pretty proud of. You can see the breakdown on the slide um, of that 91%, 75% of students went on to industry. 23% went to graduate school, and then 2% were either volunteering, maybe they entered the military, or were finishing up an internship or a co-op. The average starting salary, it was $71,300. And then you can also see the breakdown of training outside of the classroom. So again, engagement is really important for our students. 68% of students completed an internship for this class. 41% completed a research experience and 12% completed a co-op. I haven't mentioned these yet, I don't believe, but a co-op is similar to an internship in that it's work experience. Internships usually take place over the summer. Co-ops are longer. They're usually about six to nine months in nature and it's full-time work at a company. It's also a really good option for students to get some of that related work experience. As you can see, pay is very competitive for both internships and co-ops. Um, it's about $20 an hour. So that's a little bit about our outcome data. And that concludes our presentation portion of the session. So we'd like to open it up to questions from you. Please feel free to use the Q&A function on your screen to submit any questions. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, and we'd also encourage you to check out the orientation and transition experiences website listed on the slide here. That website has really great resources for families, including live and pre-recorded sessions as well. Just while we're waiting um, to see if any questions come in, I know there were some questions that um, had been answered during the session. Um, I'm not sure if everyone saw those coming in or not, but I know a pretty common, some pretty common questions right now are about housing and financial aid. And so um, for those of you that may have questions about your students' housing assignments, getting roommates, room locations, um, knowing what to pack, all of those types of things, housing does plan to have that information out by the end of the month. And the same thing for the um, financial aid packages. They are working on packaging students and we'll be sending that information out to students again by the end of the month, perhaps sooner, but definitely by the end of July. Um, there's a question that came in um, regarding how many students start in CSC and then how many graduate. Paul, I'm wondering if you'd be able to answer that. 
Paulette, you're on mute, unfortunately. Associate Dean has technical issues all the time. So that's why I'm sympathetic when your students do. So anyway, so we we graduate over 85% of our students in, in four or five years. And again, the five year is not a negative thing at all. Uh, I think Chrissy mentioned co-op. Sometimes a co-op is an actually wonderful experience and an important one, and it will extend graduation time. Our students do incredibly well. Our graduation rate 15 years ago was closer to 40%. Now we're well over 80, 85%. And there's really good reasons why students uh, don't complete in that period of time. Uh, go on to other things. Some of our students, we have had plenty of computer science students who get job offers as juniors and just leave. Um, not something we encourage, but it certainly can happen. That means they're really good. Uh, and anyway, uh, the bottom line is your students will do incredibly well. And, um, and some will actually, we, I've had a few students who, packed up and left because they started companies and were very successful. So life is complicated in a lot of pathways, but uh, as, a, as a whole, they'll do extremely well. There's another question. I, I might add, I just, Chrissy, I just interrupt. So there are typically a lot of questions. There was one question about computer, what kind of personal computer should I have? And uh, the advising team will make sure that we get in the hands of your students, particularly early on in the term probably in CC 1001, but maybe for that, sort of a summary sheet on what, we're, what we expect uh, students' computing power should be. Things have changed a lot. Um, I don't know that it's, students are equally split between PCs and Macintosh, to be quite honest. We don't load a lot of software on computers anymore. Computers are just a gateway to bigger machines. Uh, and so, in, in fact, they could probably do the whole thing from their phone, not very advisable, but uh, the point is that we'll give, we'll give them some guidance. We encourage them not to necessarily, if, if they have a machine that works right now, whether it's laptop or desktop, stick with it. Uh, wait till they come to campus. And then, and then over time, their needs may change, but we have unbelievable resources, monitors the size of you know, football screens uh, where they can do their work. So they really don't need a lot of fancy stuff, although they will try to convince you they do. But that's uh, I'm just, maybe I'm, I'm telling stories about my own children. So there you go. There's a question about when students typically do internships. Oftentimes, students will start looking for an internship during their sophomore year. Um, the cycle is early, so a lot of companies will hire for summer interns that fall. Um, so they have almost a whole academic year with an internship lined up. We do have a variety of employers, so some hire closer to the spring semester too. Um, but sophomore year is pretty typical for an internship. I would say it's certainly a lot more common for juniors to do internships as well. Sometimes students will do one their sophomore year, go on to a different company their junior year. Um, every now and then we do have some really motivated first year students that are super excited to do an internship. They can sometimes, uh, oftentimes we have employers that like to see at least a semester of technical coursework in students' repertoire before they bring them in for an intern. Um, but we do have some companies that will hire first year students and we're starting to collect more of that information as well because that is a question we get quite commonly. There was a question about um, when does it, uh, when do students typically study abroad? Um, and I think uh, other, other of my colleagues can probably answer this a little bit better um, since their time at CSE has been a little bit longer. But I do believe it, it really depends on the student. Oftentimes students maybe wait till sophomore year or junior year to, to do something for a semester. Um, I know that there have been students who study abroad their first year, um, whether that be a short-term uh, seminar um, I'm not sure if uh, first year students do a semester long, um, but it really depends on the major that your student is pursuing in the curriculum and how that kind of lines up with um, any abroad experience, but also just, you know, what your student wants to pursue. Maybe they want to, um, you know, fulfill a liberal education requirement um, by studying abroad in Spain. Um, that really depends on kind of where their, their curriculum is lined up and, and when they have the ability. There's also several questions just about majors, minors, kind of credits, curriculum. So I can just kind of quickly probably answer several of those. Um, 
when we start students out at orientation, we really want them to be open and honest with us about anything that they're considering. And so for some, that may mean many majors. For some, that might mean one. Um, some are more certain than others. And so part of what we'll do is continue to meet with students before they register for each semester to talk about where they're at with those interests. And so for many students, the courses that they're taking this fall really keep them on track for just about every major at the University of Minnesota because they're taking some things that might be specific to some type of STEM degree, but often those are also filling some of their general type requirements. And so we do have students that move within the university. We have students that add minors and majors outside of CSE and double major in something in the college. Some actually will earn dual degrees from our college. So really a lot of options. Um, and some of that flexibility and how they incorporate that will also have to do with the type of program they're pursuing, as well as that additional credit that some may be bringing in. So those coming to us with some incoming credit have some flexibility to potentially add in those minor courses, double major courses, languages and things like that. For some, they may just wanna take a little lower credit threshold. So really it's an individual conversation for each student to be having with their advisor, but we want students to be asking because we can only help them plan for what we know they may be considering. And that's also when our colleagues in the Career Center and Collegiate Life can also help students connect with opportunities and resources, whether it's from a career or internship standpoint, or maybe a student organization or, or other opportunity that might help them pursue those different interests. And I believe we're running short on time. Um, so what we might do um, is try to answer some of these uh, directly uh, via chat. Um, but uh, again, thanks for your time uh, today. We're really excited to welcome your students to CSC and the University of Minnesota this fall. Um, and please reach out if you have any other questions um, uh, from here on out. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good afternoon.